All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. We are recording during the third quarter of an insipid Cowboys Giants <laughs> matchup. Right now, it's uh, 33 nothing. Four minutes left in the third quarter. Uh, yeah, a man named uh, Dowdle uh, just rushed for five yards. Uh, so it's all happening at MetLife. Uh, we've got a lot to get to today. We'll talk about uh, the biggest takeaways from. The Sunday games, uh, and then I'll look ahead to the week two openers uh, and Monday night football as well. Bills, Jets, but Drew, how are you? How are uh, how was your Sunday, and uh, what were the biggest takeaways for you? Yeah, it was a mixed bag. Um, ultimately, my best bet in the Seattle Seahawks was a horrific loss. Um, that was about as uninspiring a second half performance as I can remember, and particularly having come from a Pete Carroll team, it was a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, I think this, there's a decent chance the Seahawks might not be very good. Um, I think there is, there, there is very, you know, there are always very weird results in week one. There are always results that you look back in halfway through the season and you kind of laugh out loud. How is it possible that that team beat this other team that's very competitive or very good or very well coached? And, um, you know, I think teams like the Rams, teams like the Cardinals even, uh, maybe even more so, um, you know, they came in and played some inspired football today after, uh, you know, a long off season of hearing about how not great they were. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some of the kind of more consequential contests like Browns Bengals, really, really tough to come away with major takeaways considering that, uh, you know, that the Bengals could and are likely were just impacted by the uh, absence of Burrow and camp uh, because of injury. And, uh, you know, there's, Still lots of questions to be answered about the uh, Browns offense and then, uh, you know, other kind of big consequential games like Niners Steelers where the Niners are amazing um, and that defense played like they have a bunch of future Hall of Famers on it. And, uh, you know, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to go on the road and do that to a team that has, you know, kind of good coaching and, and talented players, talented defense, then um, that really makes you sit up and take notice and, Brock Purdy looked fine. He looked cool as can be. He made some very impressive plays in that one. And, um, you know, I think, you know, the Cowboys obviously are answering right now <laughs> by putting on their own show. Um, but I think one of the major takeaways you're going to get from sort of the mainstream media tomorrow is can we fast forward to the NFC Championship game between the San Francisco 49ers and the Cowboys? And that's kind of where we were last week. So I think that's going to get amplified even more. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about week one is sorting out, you know, what is what is real and what is a product of the opponent. Because, for instance, mm -hmm. Philadelphia's offense did not look very good at all, but the Patriots might have a top three defense in the NFL and maybe the Eagles are the same juggernaut that they were last year. It's just that they weren't able to show it uh, today in Foxborough. Um, yeah, I think a couple things. One, I would... Even off, just after one week, I would be surprised if the NFC champion is not one of Dallas, Philadelphia, and San Francisco. I think we thought, the market thought, that those three teams were a clear tier one. Uh, I kind of came out of the Kansas City game feeling worse about Detroit um, because yeah. they really should have lost to a Kansas City team that uh, was dropping everything inside and didn't have Chris Jones or Travis Kelsey. Uh, so I think that those three teams are the clear class and you have – probably have to say advantage San Francisco there just because they don't play in the same division um, yeah. as the other two and also Seattle who uh, would be their presumptive challenger in the NFC West were probably the least impressive of any team today uh, which is saying something because my next point is about the Steelers uh, who are also savagely unimpressive I thought two of the most material things to come out of today were to do with quarterbacks in the AFC North, uh, Kenny Pickett and Deshaun Watson. I thought they both looked terrible. And I understand that, you know, Pickett is going up against uh, an elite defense in San Francisco, which is probably a top two, top three defense in the league. But, I mean, he was missing guys wide open. He had Deontay Johnson wide open for a touchdown down the middle. Just missed it. He's making terrible throws. And like, it's one week. I understand that, you know, Aaron Rodgers is one of his MVP seasons where he throws like three interceptions against New Orleans and they got blown out by 30 in week one. And Burrow had five picks against Pittsburgh in week one last year. So uh, sometimes you do have to, to minimize what you're seeing. And 
the week one right now is a hundred percent of our sample that we've seen. So you kind of you read into that sometimes too much. But I thought Pickett looked terrible. I thought Deshaun Watson looked like the guy he was at the end of last season, where he the Browns won in spite of him. He had one of the worst picks you'll ever see. Didn't he's just not throwing the ball right. I don't understand what it is. There's something mechanically wrong with him where it just doesn't look like when an NFL quarterback throws the ball. Uh, but the defense looked uh, phenomenal and like scary and moving Garrett around the formation. Uh, they look like they might be a monster. Um, so let's stay there for a second. How does your view of the AFC North change after today? Uh, well, I can't take anything away from the Ravens game. Um, sorry to say if you're super bullish about the Ravens after what you saw, then okay. Um, I think that uh, the Kenny Pickett points you made are very fair. Uh, I think that's amplified even more by the fact that he did play a lot of preseason and he looked good in the preseason. He looked like he was taking steps forward and then to come out and be that tight uh, and to make that many kind of, you know, kind of rookie type of mistakes as opposed to year in year two now and you should have taken a step forward. And, um, you know, I think what I'm mostly going to track with Pickett is if he goes like the Trevor Lawrence route. It was Trevor Lawrence in week one last year, lost to the commanders, and it was awful. And he made some mistakes in that game that were like, wow, I thought Trevor Lawrence in year two was going to take a step forward. He's got Doug Peterson now. This isn't the Urban Meyer show anymore. And he, it took until halfway through the season, and then the guy absolutely emerged, right? Um, Pickett could follow that arc, I suppose. But uh, it felt like he knew that today was a test, and he was nervous, unprepared, and didn't perform well. Uh, and he's going to have to wear that because it doesn't get easier from here. He's got two primetime games in a row the next two games. So everybody's going to see it now, right? Everybody was watching that game today, but it was in the 1 p.m. slot. There was a lot of football going on, Jay. Next week, he's on Monday Night Football against the Browns and, and Miles Garrett. The week after that, he's going up against the Raiders and Max Crosby. Um, and, uh, you know, he may not necessarily find his feet until later this season, but uh, it may be too late for the Steelers otherwise. And... Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna do some damage to any kind of hopes they had of making a very very tough playoff picture uh, happen in a, a very crowded NFC North AFC North. So, um, Bengals, I'm not hitting any kind of emergency concern at all. Deshaun Watson, it, I am out out. Yeah, he uh, he does not look right at all. Uh, and I mean, just you're kind of just running out of rope for the idea that he's going to turn back into the Houston guy because. I mean, I think a lot of people were just throwing out the last five, six weeks of last season. I never really understood that. Like, what, what is, hasn't been injured. Like, why does he look this bad? Uh, is something, is there something wrong? And people would say that it's because of all the off-field stuff and that's, you know, kind of infected his play. But at the same time, like, he was, you know, he, ha he had plenty of time to learn the playbook. He had plenty of time to practice. And the fact that now after a training camp a year further removed and he's still looking like that against the Bengals defense, which I think is perfectly solid, but certainly not the Cowboys or the Niners. So I think that's that's a concern. Uh, and Cleveland games are, are probably going to adjust pretty quickly um, to the under. Uh, yeah. On Kenny Pickett, we have uh, Raiders-Steelers coming up week three on Sunday Night Football, uh, which could be, uh, yeah, who knows, might be a 2-0 Raiders team against an 0-2 Steelers team. Uh, let's race through some of the other games. Uh, Tennessee New Orleans is a very, very strange game. Ryan Tannehill was absolutely awful. Uh, Derek Carr was better, but still wasn't super impressed by New Orleans. Uh, and then the other one I wanted to touch on Green Bay, Chicago. Now, people are going to be very confident about Green Bay coming out of that. I think that says more about Chicago the other way. Green Bay, Jordan Love was 15 of 27 and they averaged 2.9 yards per carry on the ground. I didn't think that they were ultra impressive. And I think it was more about the Bears just being, you know, a total mess where there was a lot of hype about the Bears potentially being a team that could go worse to first in their division. And I understand mm -hmm. the upside just because of Fields and his individual upside. But, I mean, they look like a bottom five team today. Yeah. Uh, and if they don't get a result next week, and we'll talk about that, they're in trouble. But uh, anything else that stood out today? No, I agree with you. Two takes there. Um, do not buy. I'm going to be very, very. Um, I'm going to need to see a lot more to buy the hype on Green Bay after that. Um, so much of the, uh, you know, so much of what was added was, 
you know, Aaron Jones on the ground after the, th- the throw, right? And there were some there were some real clunky moments in that offense for Green Bay. Like, um, if they ultimately reach their potential, I think your call of uh, uh, the Fleur coach of the year is probably in very, 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 very good shape. But uh, yeah, they uh, they are a uh, absolutely a hold, not a buy. Uh, after what we saw today, and the Bears are a sell. Uh, the Bears look like a four-win team. Um, and if you can't cover that group of receivers, uh, you're in a little bit of trouble in terms of how you're going to – your pass defense is going to get exposed pretty regularly here. Um, in the same sense, you know, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of quarterbacks, good and bad, who had negative EPA per play today for draftbacks. It was a bad day for NFL passers overall. And did yes. – some of that could be the scheme is changing everywhere. Some of it just could be, you know, week one doesn't, you know, doesn't matter as much. And so it's, you know, there's less concentration, less focus, less, you know, more trying things out and less, you know, sharp players ready to play. Preseason's different. All of these things are factors. But, um, uh, you know, I certainly didn't see any kind of improvement in the passing game from Justin Fields. I, uh, his rushing game was, uh, you know, a huge minus, which was a surprise. Some of that is obviously because, Packers defense were making plays, creating fumbles, things like that. But, um, you know, it still is a bit surprising. The Tannehill is worth pointing out, and I'm glad you brought him up. <clears throat> when you're at his stage of prog- of a progression as a quarterback and you play that poorly, that's a sign that it's maybe is over. And uh, this was about as soft a test as they could have had. I know it's on the road but he really wasn't under as much pressure as he will be when they go up against better pass rushes. Um, and he was still staring down guys, didn't have zip on the ball when he needed to. Like all of sort of the check mark stuff you say of, okay, well, if this is going to work for Tennessee, it need, they need to have this and this and this. All of it was X's, lines through everything. So Tennessee is uh, very live to finish at the bottom of that division. And uh, I expect we're going to see Will Loves and or Malik Willis maybe even uh, sooner than later, depending on uh, how things go there. But uh, Brable made some very weird decisions at the end of that game. They kicked the field goal to go de- to, to make a one-score one game, a one-score game. Um, at the end of that one, when there really wasn't enough time to get the ball back and have another chance, that was really strange. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, yeah, you know, it didn't take long to kind of figure out Matt Ryan didn't have it anymore last year. And Tan Hill's in that category right now. Yeah, that decision from Mike Vrabel, and that's as bad as I can remember, uh, where it just didn't feel real in the moment that they were going to do that, given that you're doing it to go down one. And you need the touchdown. I just and they had three timeouts in the two minute warning. And if you miss it, then they're they're like inside their own twenty. And you've still got. I didn't understand that at all. I don't think there's any justification. It's crazy how some of the best coaches in the NFL, who I think Vrabel is rightly uh, among, uh, or at least considered among, like guys like Vrabel, Shanahan, Andy Reid, Bill Belichick. Like these are the worst guys managing these game situations. I don't really understand what the uh, how the parts of their brains that make them amazing coaches in one way also just completely break down uh, in these moments. But uh, you mentioned passing not being ultra impressive for a lot of guys. Let's close out with uh, a game where it was certainly on one side at least. I think objectively the best game of the day was Miami against the Chargers and uh, to a tag of my lower going up against a decent Chargers defense certainly not well at least the perception was was that they weren't going to be flammable or anything <laughs> goes in there uh, on the road the the fortress that is SoFi Stadium uh, as we know uh, without Teron Armstead by far his best offensive lineman and to a tag of my lower goes 28 to 45 466 yards through the air, uh, three touchdowns. Those were mean. All every single one of those yards was meaningful as yeah. well. Uh, he has an 87.8 QBR, uh, 110 passer rating, and he looked like. I mean, I think people kind of forget because of how his season ended and because of the concussions. But there was a time when people were talking about Tua as a legitimate MVP candidate last year. Mm-hmm. I think we're in the second half of the year, and he got into like plus 700 to an MVP, and it was kind of. Hurts and Mahomes, but then two was right there, and he's pretty, probably going past Burrow and Allen at one point. Uh, and I'm just wondering if maybe he was just this awesome quarterback all along, and the games where he was bad, he didn't know what planet he was on. Um, and I'm just wondering if like this is 
Like, I don't think he's going to be as good as he was today, but like he looked incredible. Yeah. And you put that in contrast to how he looked when they played the Chargers at SoFi last year, where again, he played like he didn't know what planet he was on. And I don't know what happened there. I think he was 10 of 28 off the top of my head in that game and was just completely useless. And then he puts up this performance where, you know, he's pretty close to perfect. And Tyreek Hill, who, uh, I mean, through the week, we'll probably talk about offensive player of the year. Uh, but Tyreek is going to open very favorably in that market after going 11 for 215 with two touchdowns. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, Justin Herbert, who's, Basics that line was okay. He wasn't uh, into his class, uh, and it was just a very Chargers loss yeah. in the end. But uh, what did you take out of this one? All right, you nailed it. Uh, everything you said was fair. Uh, Tua, if he stays healthy, is going to be at least in the fringes, if not it, directly in the MVP discussion. If he plays as well as he plays today, they're going to challenge the Bills for the East if he's healthy. But he's fragile. So I don't think you can realistically take positions in the long term in the market for Miami anything other than Tyreek Hill offensive player of the year, which is good to minus four hundred. Yeah, well, <laughs> after today. Like yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm glad you, I know. I thought your takes on that game were right, uh, and. I, I my my opinion going into that game was all right. Vic Fangio versus Kellen Moore. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> that actually didn't really feel like that mattered at all. Fangio and the Dolphins defense were awful. Uh, I didn't think Kellen Moore did anything all that special, uh, but Mike McDaniel versus Brandon Staley was a masterclass for McDaniel. <laughs> and the Chargers are now all in with this team and this coach, and they kind of can't even really do anything about it this year. So best of luck to Brandon Staley and company in L.A. Uh, on competing in a very crowded AFC. Yeah, it's a good day for Patrick Mahomes, MVP, honestly, with uh, with Herbert losing uh, in that division and Burrow going down and Hurts won but wasn't good either. Um, Tua was probably the guy who, well, he definitely was the guy who saw his stock rise the most. Lamar wasn't very good. Um, anyway, we'll talk about that market <laughs> when we get to it. Uh, before we get to the week two openers this Sunday night, AFC, well, this coming Sunday night, AFC East rivals do battle in South Beach when Mac Jones, Bill Belichick, and the Patriots face two attack of Iloa and the Dolphins. Coverage starts at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on NBC and Peacock. It's going to be a good one. Perhaps better than the following week of uh, Steelers Raiders, but who knows? Maybe the Raiders will be okay. Uh, let's talk about week two openers. Uh, I'll just mm. run through. Some of these Eagles open seven and a half point favorites home to Minnesota on Thursday night. Totals 47 and a half. Chargers three point favorites at the Titans. Packers uh, at Falcons' pick. Chiefs minus two at the Jags. Bucks minus two and a half home to the Bears. Colts uh, one point dogs to the Texans. Lions six point favorites home to the Seahawks. Bengals minus three home to the Ravens. And Bills minus 10 and a half uh, home to the Raiders. That's the 1 p.m. slate uh, in addition to the Thursday night Eagles-Vikings game. Does anything jump out to you there as uh, stunning? Well, um, I mean, the Tampa-Chicago market is going to be super fascinating to follow because people saw what happened with Chicago and have probably downgraded them. People obviously were hot on Tampa Bay. That was one of the hottest sides going into week one. And then they win... They didn't just cover. They won, Jay. Uh, but it was at the behest of three pretty fortuitous turnovers. Uh, so it's questionable if they can continue to do that. But uh, uh, if that comes off a three by the time uh, you know, you, you're listening to this, I won't be surprised. Um, similarly, that Atlanta Green Bay is going to be one that I'm going to watch carefully because Atlanta is rostered to really give the old way that Green Bay played defense fits. They get real physical. The two-handed, you know, the two um, running back approach of Algier and Bijan Robinson, fresh legs coming at you all, 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 all game long makes Atlanta a very fun second half bet, by the way, if you didn't already know that. Uh, and I did think their defense contributed somewhat to keeping um, the, uh, the, you know, overmatched Panthers in the uh, 10 point range. So um, Atlanta is the side there for me, just based on matchup and green Bay potentially closing it as a favorite. Really? They're that good now that they're road favorites. 
uh, that's, that's an eyebrow raise for me. So, uh, that's the market I care about the most. Uh, I think the chargers probably could beat the, you know, pick their score against the Titans. Um, I don't think that the Titans are going to be all of a sudden able to find anything magic offensively with what they've running out with what they are running out there. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, uh, that one's probably going to come off three as well. So really everything that matters early in the week for me, it, besides, uh, trying to track down some injury news for the Seattle Seahawks, uh, is kind of watching these games that are sitting on or around three to see if they go, you know, you know, on or off three. Um, we didn't even mention Denver, but Denver, Washington is on the Denver side of three and a half. That was a popular bet against this last week in that range. Uh, and you know, asking Russell Wilson to win by more than three points, even at home, even against a bad team, as we know from watching today, is not necessarily a guarantee. So, um, you know, I'd say I would, would not be surprised if the uh, the people who have very, very cold feelings about Denver um, go back to market and uh, take those three and a half. So that's uh, that's, that's my general sentiment of, uh, uh, of where things stand with the openers. Does all that check out to you? Yeah, I think so. I th- was surprised that the Falcons aren't, uh, favored there, even though it's pick, it seems like it's skewing to the Packers slightly favored. I th- would have thought that was going to be Falcons minus one or so. So it doesn't like it does it doesn't matter a ton, but just would have thought that uh, the Falcons would be favored there. Though Desmond Ritter did not look great. No, no, totally no, terrible. Did not look good at all. So no, that's, uh, terrible. A little bit of a red flag for their season, though. Again, they don't play any good teams all year, so we may not. <laughs> It doesn't may not matter that Desmond Ritter's no good uh, because they'll just be able to to run the ball and play okay defense. Uh, let's just round out with the later game. So the Niners are seven point favorites at the Rams. Cowboys three point favorites home to the Jets. Uh, that might move a bit now. Tonight goes. Tonight goes for the Jets uh, and Bills. When you're listening, uh, Broncos minus four home to the Commanders, Dolphins minus two at the Patriots, Saints minus two and a half at the Panthers, and Browns minus one at the Steelers. What do you think of that Cleveland Pittsburgh line? Uh, man, does it act? It's be- it's begging to get people back in on the Steelers. Like, don't give up on them yet. Here's another chance to take a bit plus 110 on the money line. Um, but, uh, you know the a lot of the same issues they faced with how they mad their offense matched up against the uh, Niners defense is going to be very present here. Uh, it's a really really similar unit. It's a really really similar strengths and weaknesses. Not as many Hall of Famers, but still some very good players for that Browns defense. So um, I think the uh, the more interesting number there is the uh, the forty two, uh, which is the current total. Uh, and I would like to get a little info on uh, Deontay Johnson and if he will be a uh, a go for the uh, Steelers because. Uh, without him, if it's literally just Pickett and Pickens and Matt Canada calling those predictable plays and Cleveland defense playing with their hair on fire, they could win a 10-9 type of game. Yep, I agree there. Okay, and it's also Deshaun Watson going up against uh, what still, in theory, should be a pretty good Steelers defense uh, mm-hmm. when they're not playing. Uh, the apparently immortal Brock Purdy, uh, who, to his credit, looked, uh, looked pretty pretty good uh, yeah. today. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. uh, I would lean Steelers there as well. Of the young quarterbacks, only Trevor Lawrence, I thought, uh, kind of played up to Purdy's level. Yep, yep, I agree. CJ Stroud did not look did not look great. No. Bryce Young, I thought, had moments, but also um, his supporting uh, cast is so suspect. I know. Yeah, it's I, rough. It's, it's not great. And then Richardson was kind of exactly what you'd expect, where he's yeah. exciting, uh, made some big plays, uh, yeah. and you know had some brain dead plays as well so i, I think that's what yeah it'll be like. i don't know that i'm going to get involved but my guess is colts close favorite against the texans yep yep i think uh the colts definitely i mean they didn't cover but i felt like they in a way outperformed expectations because i mean it was right right there the cover they're, they're back to a cover if richardson doesn't get hurt yep yep I agree. Okay. Uh, before we close out with Bills and Jets, a reminder that Bet the Edge isn't the only show every weekday during the NFL season. You can check out the Fantasy Football Happy Hour with Matthew Berry, Connor Rogers, and me. Uh, it airs live on Peacock at noon, re-airs at 4 p.m. Eastern, and is available on our NFL and NBC Sports YouTube channel, as well as wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay. Uh, Bills, two and a half point favorites. 
at the Jets, primetime returns to MetLife Stadium for hopefully a, a more appetizing uh, serving of football. The total is 46 and a half. What's your read on this one? Yeah, I think I speak for everyone watching uh, the Sunday Night Football game. Do we have to come back? Um, <laughs> and I don't think it's going to be as lopsided, but I still think that there's a decent chance we see a little bit of a... Um, uh, a redux here where the road team comes in and gets a win, an impressive win potentially. And that's largely because I think the Jets' uh, offense is running into a buzzsaw of a defense. And uh, I think uh, the best way to play this one, because it is, you know, it's under three. If you want a side, I take the Bills. Uh, and if you want a, a, a better look, I like the under here. Uh, bet it at 47 over the summer at small stakes, got bigger stakes at 46 and a half. It's down to 45 and a half. All of that is directionally correct here is i think that uh the jets defense is nothing to be you know they're not the giants defense there's not obvious clear ways to attack them um if you can neutralize their pass rush they have depth and ex skill and experience that particularly uh you know the matchup against sauce gardner versus uh Diggs is going to be a must see tv um but i think uh ultimately the um you know the the the, the change up Changed off speed pitch that uh, the Bills have been working on off all off season. I'm I'm going to expect that that will bear fruit in this matchup, considering you can attack the safety position of the Jets. You can uh, get some of their off ball linebackers into, into difficult spots. So uh, ultimately, enough for the uh, the Bills to get a win and a cover. But uh, I think this one stays in or around 43 points actually. So I still like under 45 and a half. Yep. Speaking of Diggs, who you mentioned, his brother just forced another fumble. Uh, he won't get credit for the first one because it turned out it was pick uh, as he blasted into Saquon. But uh, Cowboys defense looking fierce. Uh, I mean, we talked about it a little bit in the shows leading up to the season, but the two flags I've really planted are on the Cowboys in the NFC and the Bills in the AFC, where mm. I don't understand why they're not the favorite to win the AFC. I think they're, I, I just go back to the fact that like last year, they were two and a half point favorites in Arrowhead and then beat the Chiefs. And then Allen did his elbow and the season spiraled out of control towards the end after what happens to Demar Hamlin and everything that the team had to go through. And I think this team is every bit as good as the team that last year was the clear Super Bowl favorite for pretty much the entire season um, heading into Allen's elbow injury. Uh, so I don't really understand why they're not rated as such. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that they are the best team in the AFC, or at least neck and neck with the Chiefs. And the Chiefs have a, lot, a home loss banked to the Lions, which... It's kind of advantage bills for the one seed. So, uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a tough initiation for Aaron Rodgers. I don't think there's anything violently wrong with the line or anything, but I do lean bills uh, at anything under a field goal. Uh, and I'm with you uh, on the point about the total as well. Uh, do you, are you still with me on the bills optimism in the AFC? I am. And I guess I got to ask you a, a pretty important follow up. You said it was a good day for Mahomes MVP by a proxy, effectively, or by everybody else kind of coming back, you know, kind of walking backwards. Is there a universe where Josh Allen does something special and moves into favorite status in that market? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think if he if he wins and he plays well, then he will kind of be the favorite by default, just because the other two favorites, Mahomes and Burrow, and they both they both lost, uh, and the one seed is carries so much equity. Uh, in that market. I do think Hertz probably firmed for MVP, even though he didn't play that well, just because he got the win in New England, which was, you know, not a 90% proposition or anything. So he banks a tough win. And also his he didn't play well and his stat line wasn't sparkling, but also there was nothing, he didn't tank his stat line or anything. No interceptions. Uh, he It was okay enough that it's not going to dent him and just getting the win uh, I think helps his case. But with Allen, I, I think I'm just always going to be, for the most part, in a position to fade Allen. And it you know depends on the context and everything each season. And maybe there'll be a point at which I think Allen is a bet on. But I just think that his player profile and the fact that he just the interceptions just never go away. He just throws double-digit picks every year, it seems like. And that's just part of his game. And that, that player profile just hasn't lent itself well to MVP, which is an award that really prizes 
efficiency and touchdown to interception ratio. Uh, and so, you know, someone like Jalen Hurts, who just never throws picks at all, uh, I think it kind of lends itself more towards him. Mahomes, you know, Mahomes is Mahomes. So I still think that Mahomes should be the favorite in that market, which sounds crazy because he's 0-1 with a home loss. But I still think that Mahomes should be narrowly favored in that market, just ahead of of Hertz. They're not ruling out Burrow yet. Allen, um, Allen is probably second favorite just in front of Hertz. Anyway, that's pretty close. So I think we'll know a lot more after tomorrow as well. Because Aaron Rodgers wins tomorrow night against Josh Allen uh, and looks like the guy that he was in 2021 then all of a sudden he's pretty firmly in the thick of it as well. I don't think yeah. he's that guy anymore, but you know, it was only two years ago that he was that guy. So uh, yeah, yeah uh, lot uh, to sort through that game. If Aaron Rodgers wins against the Jets and gets any kind of momentum for MVP, Jay, we're, 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 uh, we're on to NBA season. Yeah. I'm, I'm not having it. I, I'm not, I'm not ready to consume NFL content that is centered around the world of Aaron Rodgers. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> yep. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with you. It's uh strange thing it's still a strange thing that he's the quarterback of the new york jets um and is just yeah popping up popping up everywhere um and then they love him and he's a content machine he's the best quarterback the jets have ever had it's unbelievable not even 40 year old aaron Rodgers. don't even know who's second joe namath i guess it's not great not great for the jets and they're they're very very happy with aaron but uh, anyway, we'll see how they go tonight when everyone is listening. All right, we're done. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks for those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, please don't forget to rate and subscribe. And a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Crouch and Drew Dinsick. We'll see you tomorrow.